We are starting this new series called Glow because uh, we're going to talk about some stuff as it pertains to your life and glowing for Jesus. Um, but in, in reality, more like how Jesus can be the light of your life in certain ways. And we have Glow Wars coming up this weekend, so it all ties together. It's, not, it's all nice and pretty. So um, you have some stuff in your groups right now. It will come in handy in a few minutes, but try not to let it distract you too much until that point. I got a, a quick question for you guys. Um, how many of you are introverts, meaning you like to be alone? How many of you, how many of you are not introverts? You're in the right place. Um, but for, for those of you who are introverts, this, this question, may, may, uh, you, you may answer it a little bit differently. Uh, but how many of you would just be happy to spend hours walking around the mall? Anybody? Okay, how, how about this? Go, go on a long hike in the woods. Anybody? Okay, all right. How, how about, how many of you would love to have an amusement park all to yourself? Is that better? Okay. Um, how, many of you, uh, how many of you would love to go for a swim in the middle of the ocean? You, you take your boat, you drop the anchor, no one else is around, you just go swimming. Yeah, anybody? Some of you maybe? All right, so th think about that. Um, now, now I wanna turn the tables a little bit. Now, I'm gonna give you the same question, uh, but just slightly altered, okay? The same set of questions, all right? How many of you would love to spend hours walking around the mall in the middle of the night? The same, hand, actually more hands, that uh, was not supposed to go that way. How about this? Go on a long hike in the woods in the middle of the night. Okay, have an amusement park all to yourself in the middle of the night when everything is closed. Everything's closed. It's the middle of the night. There's no workers. You're just by yourself in this big amusement park. Where are the killers go and hide? No, nothing's on. How about this? This one, your answers might be the same, but go for a nice swim in the middle of the ocean in the middle of the night. If, if swimming in the ocean were scary enough, imagine it dark and you can't see anybody there, right? There's something about, right? There's something about the darkness or the night that makes things a little bit different. The mall's fine when it's like the middle of the day, but when it's like the middle of the night and nobody is there, it's pretty creepy, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty fun to have an amusement park all to yourself until you realize it's the middle of the night, nobody else is there and it's closed and you hear weird sounds and you're afraid that somebody might come out and murder you, right? That things are a little bit different. Going on a hike in the woods sounds like a great time until it's the middle of the night and you're lost. And you know, you think of all the scary movie ideas of what could happen if a serial killer just jumped out and started murdering you, right? I, I don't know why middle of the night leads to murder. It just, it, it makes the connection in my head. When it's the middle of the night and it's dark and you're doing something by yourself, it's freaky, right? Can I get an amen, right? Oh. I'll, I'll give you a perfect example, right? We've, we've all been in those situations where, uh, where things feel uh, maybe more scary in the moment they do, than they do in hindsight because your mind starts playing tricks on you, right? Uh, the, the example I want to show you comes from the beloved cartoon SpongeBob SquarePants, um, where, where if you don't know, he lives in a pineapple under the sea and uh, he has a best friend named Patrick and he works in a place called the Krusty Krab and his coworker Squidward um, in order, they have to work at night one time, and in order to entertain himself, Squidward tells SpongeBob a scary story about ghosts, and, um, and it's all fun and games until it just becomes a little bit too real for them. So uh, check, out, check out this video. <laughs> uh, I, I gotta love some good SpongeBob. My wife is obsessed. Her, uh, her best friend, his name's Sarah, and, uh, and growing up, like they, they would text all the time, but they changed their names like in high school and their phones. And it's still that way to this day where she's Sarbob, not Sarah. And Chelsea is like Chesrick or something like that because SpongeBob and Patrick, anyway, it's fine. It's, SpongeBob's a good show. It's melting your brain cells as you watch it, but it's good. All right, um, I want you guys to discuss in your group for a little bit. Um, I'm going to give you guys three minutes. There's going to be a countdown on the slide, but there's a couple questions 
up there for you. Uh, I want you to discuss those for a minute, and then uh, when the timer's up, you can look back here. So uh, Haley, you can click the next slide. That'll have a timer, and then there you go. Isn't it true that when we're in the darkness, our fears tend to get amplified? Like every little shadow or movement could be a threat. And like even, even if you're faced with a threat in the light, at least you can see it, assess it, and evaluate next steps, whether it's to punch it in the face or to run the up opposite direction, right? You, you can't do that if it's dark, right? It amplifies our, our fears. It heightens our like threat awareness. Um, perfect example was when we first uh, installed our ring alarm system on our house, um, we, you have these little tabs that you put on all the doors and stuff. And so we have a sliding door in our kitchen and it's, it's a little older. So sometimes when you pull it, it like, it jolts a little bit and it knocks the sensor off like slightly so that it shows tampered on the app. And, uh, and so I didn't know this at first. So the alarm was new. We, you know, set it right before bed. And, uh, and what had happened was that alarm, had, that sensor had been tampered just slightly, but it didn't come all the way off. So it's still showing is connected. But at about three in the morning, the, the sensor finished unsnapping and then the alarm went off. And out of instinct, I like, like, you know, when your alarm goes off in the morning, you like quickly try to turn it off. Well, I started doing that and I started trying to quickly turn the ring alarm off. And then I was like, no, no I don't need, I need to get up and assess the threat, right? And so then I jump out of bed and you know, I'm running around the house, like checking the doors. And then I'm like, I should, I should check which door went off. And so then I'm pulling up the app and I'm like, which door was it? And I'm looking around and, and then I, I realized, okay, it was the kitchen door. So I go and I look, it's still locked. No, nobody came in. Like, I, I don't, I don't understand. And then I looked at the sensor and realized that it had been tampered. I realized what happened. I was like, oh, we can go back to bed. But then, of course, you're wide awake and you can't go back to bed. So then I get back out of bed and I start walking around the whole house just to make sure nobody like pulled a fast one, came in, relocked it, and then like is hiding in the basement where our kids are at. So I'm, I'm walking around looking everywhere. But at night, when it's dark, the threat becomes amplified. Like your fears become amplified and, and grow to be scarier because you can't see, you can't assess. And, and that's not only true in like physical darkness, but it's true in just general discomfort, uneasiness, the, the darkness of the soul, you might say, whenever you're going through something difficult in life. The fear of the unknown or what you can't see becomes amplified, right? Uh, imagine, like, maybe some of you have gone to a new school, right? You, you've, you've had to face something in your life that caused you to have to face a whole new set of circumstances when you didn't see it coming, right? Uh, m maybe you, uh, you had to find a new group of friends or you, you were trying out for a new team or, or navigating just general life changes in your life. But when we can't see, when, it, when we don't know what's ahead or what's around us, our fears can become amplified and start to dictate our, our actions. It can rob us of our peace. So when have things seemed dark in your life? I mean, you think about that, discuss that with your group for the next two minutes, and then we will continue on. Here, here's the deal, right? Uh, these moments of darkness can leave us feeling uneasy, lost, alone, uh, uh, anxious, right? Uh, and, and so whether, whether it's like physical darkness or it's like something else in your life that just leaves you feeling like you're in a dark place, right? Light would be super helpful, right? Some hope would be super helpful. Um, and so I, Jesus was no stranger to this of, uh, of dark moments, in fact, he went through the ultimate dark moment on our behalf, uh, which we're going to get into a little bit more. But the reality is, I, I want to do a little exercise with you, because I'm going to read a passage from John chapter 13, but I want you to, to, to play a little game here. Without opening your Bibles, I'm going to read this, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you guess what you think should happen next, all right? So this is John 13. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son, uh, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So, in these three verses, we find out that Jesus uh, has all power that God has given to him. He knows that Judas is about to betray him, the man that he spent three years with, 
and has mentored him and has become close friends with him, about to betray him and hand him over to be then beaten, uh, crucified. And, and so knowing all that and knowing that Jesus was sitting there knowing all these things, what do you think should have happened next in the story? Well, if it were you writing the story, if you're in Jesus' position, you know you're about to go through your darkest hour, or at least you know that's what's on the horizon, and you have all power in the world to do something about it, and the person sitting amongst you is your friend who's going to betray you, what should happen next? You're writing the story, turn to your group and discuss that for a minute. So, there, there were so many options for what Jesus could have done there, right? Having, having all power in his hand, being the literal son of God, being God in human nature, knowing what was about to happen, and knowing that it would be at the hand of one of his closest friends. He had the power to do anything he wanted. He could have smite Judas right there and be like, this is my house, and then walked out and then like proclaimed his kingship, right? He, he could have done all this, he, it, it, but he doesn't. He, he could have taken everything into his own hands and made everything right and just according to him because he's God. But instead, this is what happens. Having, every, having knowledge of what was about to happen and knowing Judas, having all this power, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. And, and basically, Jesus is taking the position of the lowest servant to do this, right? Which he's this esteemed rabbi in their eyes. He's like, you, you should not be doing it. They know he's Lord. They know he's God. And he's like, you shouldn't be washing my feet. I should be washing yours. And Jesus says, no, you don't, you don't understand right now, but later you will. And Peter says, no, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Right? <laughs> Peter quickly changes his tune. He says, well, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Right? By all means. Then Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Right? Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So, Jesus, being with all his friends, knowing he's about to be executed and all this stuff, he could have taken the time to just relax, have a last meal with his friends, have a good time. He, he could have, again, like just put on that golden crown and step out and be like, no one can touch me. I'm not dying today. He could have done anything. He was perfect. He didn't deserve death. But he chose to serve, he chose to love, and he chose to empathize with his friends. Now, his disciples must have been, like, their, their minds must have been spinning because, like, just earlier that week, like, Jesus had marched into town on a donkey and everyone was singing Hosanna. Like, they probably thought he was about to crown himself king in, in, in a political way. Like, he was going to overthrow Rome that week. Like, they, they thought that he was probably, like, this is the height of his ministry. He's raised people from the dead, he's healed people, but now he is going to literally fulfill the prophecy uh, as the Messiah and take his rightful place as king, right? And his disciples were ready to be there because they'd be esteemed and honored by being there with him. And then Jesus is talking about death and he's talking about like, you know, serving them. And there's all these mysteries like you don't understand now, but you will later, right? Their, their heads must have been spinning trying to figure out what, what just happened. They probably had a little bit of whiplash, right? Imagine how confused they might have been, right? Um, this was about to be the worst night of Jesus' life. And he chose to spend his last moments loving those around him, serving them, and, and putting them before him. And, and in fact, the night doesn't end there. As the night goes on, Jesus, this is just evidence. Jesus is willingly walking into the storm that was before him. 
when a soldier was injured trying to arrest Jesus, right? Because Peter was trying to be the tough guy and cut off his ear. Jesus puts it back on him and heals him. And then says, now you can arrest me, right? Um, when a government official couldn't find a legal way to get Jesus uh, out of his trial, Jesus forgave him and, and, and freed him from that burden, right? Uh, when a criminal was sentenced to the same execution as Jesus, he comforted him while he was suffering his own execution. When Jesus breathed his last few breaths, he looked out of the crowd and ensured that his good friend would be there to look after his mother during this difficult time. It seemed like during this whole dark hour, this darkest night, this dark moment in Jesus' life, the whole reason he came, he still wasn't even thinking about himself. He's thinking about taking care of those around him, even those who were actively persecuting him. That says something about who he is and what he thinks about us and how, honestly, we should approach all of our relationships. I mean, imagine if you treated your siblings this way. Or you treated your friends this way. Or, or better, you treated those who are your rivals in this way. You chose to actively serve them. Maybe even knowing that they would betray you in a moment's notice, given the chance. But you choose to actively put their needs before your own and serve them. I mean, think about it. Jesus still washed Judas's feet. Right? It says he washed all their feet. Can you imagine what Judas felt in that moment? Unfortunately, it didn't change his actions, and you won't be able to change the actions of those around you all the time. But that's not your job. Your job is to serve. Your job is to love the way that Jesus did. So uh, I want you to discuss this a little bit with your group. You'll have a few more minutes, and then we'll, we'll continue on. Check this out. Jesus knew, even though going through this dark moment, even though he was going through all this, he still knew what was in store ahead. He had an advantage that nobody else realized because he understood what this was all for and what it would accomplish. And that's why Paul says this to the church in Philippi. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And that, and, and that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. And every uh, tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So even though he was the son of God, he, he could have taken advantage of that. He didn't. He chose to put others first still. He chose to love. Jesus chose to step into the darkness with us. Even though he could have avoided it, he chose to step into the darkness with us. And what I want you to remember is that Jesus is with us in the darkness. Anytime we go through stuff in life, I want you to remember Jesus is with us in the midst of it. It, it didn't go away for him, and it won't always go away for us in the moment. But there is a victory at the end of it, right? If I were to take these glow sticks and crack them, right? How many of you guys like glow sticks? Like, they're super fun, I think. They're super satisfying to crack open. But... You can tell that they're glowing, right? It's a light in here right now, but you can tell that it's glowing, right? Just like if I were to take my phone out and turn the light on, right? You, you can see that there's a light, but it's not really making much of a difference right now in the light room. We, we tend to take light for granted because it's light, right? Those of you who grew up in church, maybe you take church for granted. You take Jesus for granted because you've never known light, life in the darkness yet. So, yeah, it, it, there's, there's some light, but it doesn't necessarily change much for you. But, Corbin, if I ask you to turn all the lights out, right, light becomes immensely important. It becomes much more important when there doesn't seem to be any light anywhere, right? There's a few lights in the room, obviously, but it's much darker now. And if I were to take some more of these glow sticks here, right, you know that you'd be able to see at least my face at least my face a little bit better if I crack these open. Even, even though it's dark right now, right? I, I could take my phone out, I could turn the light on, and then you'd be able to see me again, be a little bit more comfortable, a little less uncomfortable. But you just kind of have to wait and see, right? Do you guys, you guys think I could? 
light everything up? I could. All right, you, you can go ahead and turn the lights back on. Now, even though it was dark and you knew that I could have made light, but I didn't, how does that make you feel, right? Well, the point I'm getting at is, is simple. You knew that there was a power that I possessed to drive out the darkness. And it wasn't a matter of if I could. It was when I would. Right? Eventually, I just had Corbin turn all the lights on. Right? Jesus will light up your darkness. So it is not a matter of if, but when. And sometimes we get impatient and we think God's not there. We mistake his silence as his absence. And it's just not true. Even Jesus chose not to turn the light on for some of the most important moments of history in order to accomplish something he had a greater plan for. It's not a matter of if Jesus can turn on the light in your life. It's a matter of when. And our job is to trust that. So first, while it's dark, talk to Jesus. Okay? When your life feels dark, talk to him. He's been there. Hebrews tells us that... that we have a Lord who is not unable to sympathize with our weakness. He, he has lived life as a human. He knows what it's like to be in the dark. So talk to him. Don't shut him out just because it's dark. And secondly, remember. Remember his promises. Remember the truth. That remember, while there was a crucifixion, three days later there was a resurrection. And light eventually came. Joy comes in the morning. So remember the truth. Right? Right? Uh, I'm going to give you just a, a few minutes to talk with your group. Um, I'm going to speed this up to, it's going to say three minutes on the timer, but I'm going to speed it up to two minutes. So when you see one minute, I'm going to go ahead and move on, all right? It, it's, it's, it's natural to be scared or intimidated in the dark moments, um, but that doesn't have to be the end of the story. Uh, so what I want you to do right now is uh, you've got those cards in front of you, right? And uh, I've got some instructions on the screen. I want you to uh, in, in just the next couple minutes, write down some situations from your life that uh, have felt intimidating or uncertain to you, right? And then I want you to write down how you felt when you were unsure how something would work out and you didn't want to try or, or when you were afraid and didn't think that you'd ever feel secure again, all right? If, if you never had one of those, imagine what that might be for you and write it down, okay? Uh, I'm going to give you just maybe 30 seconds or a minute. I know some of you are still writing. I'm going to kind of move on since we're getting low on time. So when you're done with that, I want you to write at the bottom because we all know, we've all been through unfun circumstances where it feels like, you know, what is God doing? Is he, is he here? What's going to happen in the future? Uh, and, and it makes us feel uncertain, you know, obviously. And so at the bottom of that, I want you to write this reminder that Jesus is with us in our darkness. So whatever you have written on the top half of your card or whatever you've written on that card, just under it, write, Jesus is with us in our darkness. As that reminder, so that when you see that situation, you can remember that there is a truth and a promise that supersedes your circumstances. Okay? The idea of being camping in the woods alone at night or walking around an amusement park all by yourself in the middle of the night, it can all feel scary unless you have friends with you. And then, then it's, it might still be a little scary, but at least you know you're not alone. It eases the discomfort when you're in it with other people. And that's what your small group is for your life. You have other people with you in the darkness. And, and suddenly, the, those, those dark places where it seems like nobody is there, where it seems uncertain, it seems like it's full of fear, uh, the fear of the unknown can become anticipation for a new adventure when you go through it with other people. So, uh, as, as your response to that, I want you to flip over your card and I, I want you to write down what you hope or what you wish someone would have done for you when you were in that circumstance, uh, when, when you felt most alone, when you were afraid. What, what did you wish somebody would have done for you or what do you wish someone would do for you if you were in that circumstance? Write that on the back of your card. I want you to remember, some of you, you, maybe you've never gone through something like this before, but you will. We all go through tough times, right? You, a lot of you are still young, maybe you've not. Some of you 
You've experienced things beyond your years, things that nobody your age ever, ever have to experience. And you've been through the darkness. Some of you, you're still in the middle of some darkness, right? M- maybe those around you know about it. Maybe they don't, but you, you're going through something tough. I want you to remember Jesus is with us in our darkness, right? He doesn't leave us alone. And, and we have the promise that one day it will all be made right because tell you what, the end of the story has already been written. And guess what? We win. Those who follow Jesus, there's not going to be much darkness for long. So we can have faith. We can have companionship and people with us. That's, that's what the church is for. And I want you to remember, ultimately, we have Jesus with us in our darkness.